Now our first topic for today is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, AD EKD. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. To make a diagnosis of uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, remember these three features. In the PLAB1 exam, if a patient is described to have Hematuria, hypertension, and loin or flank pain. So, hematuria, hypertension, loin or flank pain. If these three features are present in present in a patient, then you will suspect autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And the initial screening test to confirm your diagnosis is ultrasound of the kidney, ureter, and bladder. Genetic testing is usually not done. An important association that you need to remember with uh, adult polycystic kidney disease is uh, that adult polycystic kidney disease is associated with <clears throat> intracranial aneurysm. Adult Polycystic kidney disease can lead to progressive chronic kidney disease. So, other causes of uh, chronic kidney disease include hypertension and diabetes mellitus. The third cause is adult autosomal polycystic kidney disease. And some more causes include glomerulonephritis, such as membranous glomerulonephropathy and Focal segmental glomerulonephritis. All of them can lead to chronic kidney disease or end stage renal disease. So, if in the exam uh, they ask what is the screening investigation for patient with positive family history of uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, then your answer will be ultrasound scan. How uh, you can confirm the diagnosis of uh, AD, PKD on ultrasound scan. Remember these criteria, the ultrasound diagnostic criteria for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease include two cysts, unilateral or bilateral, if the patient is less than 30 years of age. So in, if the patient age is less than 30 years, then two cysts, either unilateral or bilateral, they'll make a diagnosis of a polycystic kidney disease, but if the person is 30 or above 30 and below 60, then two cysts in both kidneys should be present to make a diagnosis of adult polycystic kidney disease. And if the person is aged above 60 years, then four cysts in both kidneys should be present to make a diagnosis of adult polycystic kidney disease. So two cysts, unilaterally or bilaterally, patient is less than 30 years of age. And 30, between, if the patient is between 30 and 59, then two cysts should be present in both kidneys. And if the patient is above 60, then four cysts should be present in both kidneys. The clinical features we have discussed already. And the clinical features that you need to remember for lab one exam to make a diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease, they include loin or flank pain, hematuria and hypertension. Other than that, polycystic kidney disease can cause abdominal pain, it can cause renal stones due to stasis of urine, it can cause recurrent UTIs. What are the extra renal manifestations of polycystic kidney disease? Remember that in 70% of the patient uh, with polycystic kidney disease, the cysts are also present in the liver. 
but uh, an important extra renal manifestation that we need to remember for exam purposes is barrier aneurysm. That polycystic kidney disease is associated with barrier aneurysm. Other uh, extra renal manifestations include cardiovascular system involvement and cysts in other organs such as pancreas, spleen, thyroid, esophagus, or ovary. They are not important to remember for. Uh, you just need to remember this highlighted extra renal manifestation for PREV1 exam purposes. Now, some uh, remember. Uh, two important key points or exam tip related to this topic. In scenarios with hematuria plus hypertension are almost always polycystic kidney disease. So if a scenario is mentioning hematuria plus hypertension plus flank pain, then it is almost always polycystic kidney disease. And often they ask question about a screening test for polycystic kidney disease and uh, give you an option between genetic testing for PKD1 gene or an ultrasound scan. Remember that you will always, your answer should always be ultrasound scan and not PKD1 uh, genetic testing. Because genetic testing is a complex process uh, because the gene is large, and there are hundreds of uh, described mutations. So genetic testing, you will never choose a genetic testing as a screening test in the PLAB1 exam for polycystic kidney disease. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is affiliated with berry aneurysm. And when berry aneurysm is ruptured, can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if a patient present to you, with subarachnoid hemorrhage and a history of chronic kidney disease or hematuria and hypertension, then your diagnosis will be polycystic kidney disease. So this was all about polycystic kidney disease. <clears throat> the points that are uh, important to remember is that ultrasound is a screening test and it is associated with berry aneurysm, which can rupture and can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. Our next topic is hemolytic uremic syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, is an important cause of uh, acute renal failure in children as well as in adults. It is more common in children. Hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, is caused by a toxin of E. coli. What happens that if uh, someone eat an undercooked, undercooked contaminated food of uh, E. coli strain O157, which produces a toxin that is known as virotoxin, which can cause profuse diarrhea. That is first watery diarrhea, and then it turns to bloody diarrhea. So watery diarrhea that turns to bloody diarrhea and after the diarrhea, the patient develop a uremic feature or acute renal failure or hematuria, then you will suspect hemolytic uremic syndrome. So hematuria or AKI after diarrhea, that was initially watery and then turned into bloody diarrhea the diagnosis will be hemolytic uremic syndrome. Because the toxin that is produced by the E. coli and that is a virotoxin, 
it can cause endothelial endothelial cell damage or endothelial cell dysfunction in the kidney tubules which can lead to hematuria as well as other features that include thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia so endothelial dysfunction can lead to hemolytic anemia thrombocytopenia and uremia this triad is present in hemolytic uremic syndrome that is caused by the toxin that is produced by o157 strain of e coli which causes watery diarrhea and then it turns into bloody diarrhea because hemolytic uremic syndrome is caused by the toxins that is released by the bacteria so if the patient develop hemolytic uremic syndrome then antibiotic will not be used because if we administer antibiotic in such cases what will happen that and the bacteria will be killed and it will release uh, more toxin so it will worsen the condition so in the management of hemolytic, hemolytic uremic syndrome antibiotics are not used now same patient who develop hemolytic anemia uremia and thrombocytopenia after diarrhea if he or she has fever and neurological symptoms along with these three features if the patient also has fever and neurological symptoms then your diagnosis will be ttp thrombotic thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura so hemolytic uremic syndrome is if a person develop hematuria or renal failure following an episode of uh, diarrhea that is initially watery and then bloody other features include hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia and if the same person also has fever and neurological symptoms then we will call it as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura what is the management of hemolytic uremic syndrome management of hemolytic uremic syndrome is simple as the person has developed aki so iv fluids and there is hemolytic anemia so if the hv is less than 8 then blood transfusion so the treatment of hemolytic uremic syndrome and ttp both of them is mainly sportive treatment sportive treatment iv fluids blood transfusion and if severe kidney failure then dialysis and in very severe cases plasma exchange can be done plasma exchange is a process in which the personal plasma is exchanged so that the toxins that is present in the plasma that can be eliminated from the body so this was all about hemolytic uremic syndrome and ttp or oh, is there any question is it clear up till now no question so hematuria after uh, diarrhea is either hus or ttp now hematuria after respiratory tract infection hematuria that develop after upper respiratory tract infection you will think of three things one is ig glomerulonephritis second is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and third one is hinich scullin purpura hsp 
so hematuria after diarrhea you will think of two differential diagnoses one is hemolytic uremic syndrome and the other is ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and hematuria that develops after a history of upper respiratory tract infection you will think of three things ig glomerulonephritis that is also known as burger disease or mesangioproliferative glomerulonephritis the second one is post septococcal glomerulonephritis and the third one is in it skill and purpura all three of them will be presented with features of hematuria then how you are going to differentiate between these three first of all let's uh, differentiate how let's discuss how to differentiate between iga glomerulonephritis or post septococcal glomerulonephritis the person develop uh, hematuria one to two days after upper respiratory tract infection then it is iga glomerulonephritis and if the person develop hematuria um, one to two weeks after upper respiratory tract infection then it is post septococcal glomerulonephritis <clears throat> the main presenting feature of iga glomerulonephritis is hematuria and post septococcal glomerulonephritis Uh, main presentation is protein urea though it has a mis mixed features it can present with protein urea as well as hematuria post septococcal glomerulonephritis is associated with decreased complement levels of c3 and renal biopsy shows humps on electron microscope so remember these point to differentiate between iga glomerulonephritis and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis iga glomerulonephritis is if the patient develops hematuria one to two days after a respiratory tract infection and post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is if the person develops hematuria one to two weeks after a respiratory tract infection other points that will favor the diagnosis of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis they include decrease complement levels of c3 and hump humps on electron microscopy on renal biopsy renal sclen purpura is a variant of a systemic variant of burger disease or iga glomerulonephritis because it is a systemic variant so it will involve other organs such as skin abdomen and joints so if a person develop hematuria after a history of upper respiratory tract infection and there is also a rash a skin rash uh, that is mainly limited to the lower limb buttocks and thighs abdominal pain and joint pain then your diagnosis will be in its colon purpura <clears throat> as its as its name indicate there will be a purpura or a rash that will be limited to that is found mostly in the lower limbs and is limited to the buttocks and thighs so after a history of upper respiratory tract infection a person develop hematuria plus a skin rash plus joint pain plus abdominal pain then your diagnosis will be in it skin purpura so this was all about hematuria after a history of upper respiratory tract infection and the differential diagnosis of hematuria after upper respiratory tract infection they include three diseases one is post septococcal glomerulonephritis the other is iga glomerulonephritis and third one is hsv phoenix skin purpura Our next topic is 
causes of large kidneys and causes of small kidneys on ultrasound we have discussed that uh, multiple cysts are formed in polycystic kidney disease so it can it will cause large kidneys and the second reason the second diagnosis for large kidneys is obstructive uropathy obstructive uropathy can be caused by stones it can be caused by enlarged prostate so large kidneys on ultrasound can be caused by polycystic kidney disease it can be caused by prostate hyperplasia or prostate cancer or stones what about small kidneys hypertensive renal disease can cause small kidneys Bilateral renal artery stenosis can cause small kidneys. Chronic pyelonephritis can also cause small kidneys, and chronic glomerulonephritis will also cause small kidneys. So, small kidneys, uh, the causes of small kidneys on ultrasound, remember four things one is hypertensive renal disease, second is bilateral renal artery stenosis, third is chronic pyelonephritis and fourth is uh, chronic glomerulonephritis. How we are going to differentiate between the different causes of small kidneys? Some important points, some important features because they are tested often in the exam. So <clears throat> the first cause of small kidney is hypertensive renal diseases. In a scenario uh, in which they want to pick you hypertensive renal diseases as a cause of small kidneys there will be a history of a long term high blood pressure will be given in the scenario or in the question stem so if someone with a long term high blood pressure history and there are small kidneys on ultrasound then your diagnosis will be hypertensive renal disease remember that hypertensive renal disease will cause bilateral small kidneys bilateral renal artery stenosis can also cause small kidneys how a scenario of uh, bilateral renal artery stenosis uh, will be asked in the exam. <clears throat> Remember that a patient with bilateral renal artery stenosis is RFTs or renal function test or PFT kidney function test will be worsened after an intake of an ACE inhibitors because ACE inhibitors in bilateral renal artery stenosis GFR is already reduced and taking a ACE inhibitor reduce the GFR further. That's why if a patient has uh, bilateral renal artery stenosis and he take ACE inhibitor, then his creatinine will get worse acutely. So this is the hint that is often given in the exam to make a diagnosis of bilateral Chronic pyelonephritis, uh, the small kidneys that are caused by chronic pyelonephritis. <clears throat> In these questions, uh, a history of recurrent uh, upper urinary tract infections will be given. So someone with a history of uh, multiple or repeated or recurrent UTIs and small kidneys, your diagnosis will be chronic pyelonephritis. And if any of these feature is not given, that is high term, uh, long term high blood pressure or recurrent UTIs or worsening of kidney with ACE inhibitor and only small kidneys with protein urea is given, then your diagnosis will be chronic glomerulonephritis. So this was all about 
uh, the causes of small kidneys and how to differentiate between them. I hope it's clear to everybody. Now, hemodialysis. What are the indications for hemodialysis that you need to remember? So can somebody tell me uh, what are the two important electrolytes whose balance is disturbed in end stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease? Anyone? Urea and creatinine. Urea and creatinine. Any ions or electrolytes? Uh, potassium and sodium. Potassium and sodium. So what is the potassium abnormality present in the chronic kidney disease patient? Um, potassium will be raised. Yes, hyperkalemia is present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about sodium? Uh, there will be hyponatremia. Hyper or hypo? hypo hyponatremia. Yes, hyponatremia. Any other electrolyte abnormality that is important? along with potassium, remember the other ion that is always associated with potassium abnormalities. Whenever there is a problem in the excretion of the potassium, there will be a problem in the excretion of the hydrogen ion. So these two electrolytes, that is potassium and hydrogen ion, potassium is increased, which will cause hyperkalemia and which can lead to arrhythmias. So it is dangerous. And the second electrolyte is hydrogen ion. Hydrogen ion increase will lead to metabolic acidosis, which is also dangerous. So hyperkalemia, refractory hyperkalemia and severe metabolic acidosis, both of them are indication for hemodialysis. Along with these electrolytes, uh, other things that a patient can develop with end-stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease is pulmonary edema or floor load with an urea. So hyperkalemia, acidosis, fluid overload with an urea or pulmonary edema, all of them are indication for hemodialysis. Person with CKD can develop uremic pericarditis. So uremic pericarditis is also an indication for hemodialysis. So remember these indication for hemodialysis. Now our last topic in nephro is a dynamic bone disease. Sometimes what happens in chronic kidney disease patient that uh, they are over supplemented with vitamin D and calcium tablets. They take excessive amount or more than the amount that is required of vitamin D and calcium tablet, which lead to an over replacement of these vitamin D and calcium. What will happen if a patient take vitamin D and calcium tablet or if there is over replacement of these two, it will lead to over suppression of parathyroid hormone. 
and when there is low parathyroid hormone in the body due to excessive intake of vitamin d and calcium tablet bone turnover will be reduced which will lead to bone pain so this is known as a dynamic bone disease sometimes in the pleb uh, exam a question will be asked that a patient will be described with features of ckd and that he is taking vitamin d and calcium tablet and he has developed bone pain and they will ask you about the cause of the bone pain though the patient is taking vitamin d and calcium but still he is having bone pain then your answer will be a dynamic bone disease or another right answer can be over replacement of vitamin d and calcium which has led to suppression of pth and suppression of pth will cause reduced bone turnover due to which the patient will develop bone pain so this was all about nephrology our nephrology chapter is finished if someone has any questions and they can ask